Thank you for coming. Um, so this talk is designed to encourage us to consider how and why we should critically consider the kinds of technological utopian landscapes that are proposed as our urban futures. And I've just walked here through, the, through your sort of skyline development with a Lieberskin going up. So, you know, there are parallels between different cities. Um, we'll look at the terms in this talk. Um, Escape architecture, cybernetics, and the picturesque. Um, and I'll go through each of them sort of term by term, and then we'll build up to um, sort of an idea at the end about what a cybernetic picturesque might be. And then I'll explain why I think it's useful to consider um, images of how, why images of the future um, should be sort of critically led, read through a lens of the picturesque, which I'll explain what all of that is, um, and how that might help us to see what's concealed and buried underneath. And I also apologize not only for speaking in English, but there are references in here which are kind of British focused, and that's just because we're a bit provincial, um, and all, I spent my whole life in London and Britain, so all of my references come from there, and a lot of the references within the architectural history and studying and teaching I do too. So there are references in there, but I think they're parallel and they can be explored, and maybe in the conversation we can pick that up, or in the, the kabucha bar after. Um, so when we think of the history of video games, focus is often given to tropes of violence, wasted youth, distraction, and escape from reality. Um, games, video games have historically been either a driver of other technologies or reflected cultural or political concerns of their day. And historically, we can look at them as we can to all culture to reflect upon where we are now and what ingredients led to current concerns and political issues. Uh, networked and community, um, Games can bring network and community together. And what's wrong with escape, escape, if, uh, if it can take you into a place in which you or anyone can feel more comfortable, more at home, more yourself, or like the world has improved in some way? And in making that other place, um, we have allowed technology to support us in towards replicating the physical world, a shift towards a kind of simulacra, one of surface which represents maybe what we live in, but an idealized surface. Um, which looks a bit like what we know. And so this is kind of where it started. This is a bit before my gaming history. Um, Multi-user dungeon, like a choose-your-own-adventure text game, which was made on ARPANET, and it was like an internet network um, where you can sort of multiplayer have like a, a dungeon game through text. Bit before my time, but the next list of games are a bit more of like a personal ethnography of my history of video games, but also, um, I think, take us through a sort of a narrative of how landscape and architecture has been kind of referenced in video games and has changed. And um, starting here with The Hobbit, which I do remember playing a bit later in the 1980s. And I remember playing this game with like incredible wonderment, wonderment at the realize, realization of these scenes we're looking at and the imagination they kind of caused in my head. And in this game, which is like I played on the Spectrum, 48K, there was 23 screens like this. It was kind of, you know, an incredible depth of real world imagination. Um, and you kind of had to choose your own way through it. Um, and then games world progressed rapidly. Um, so where are we now? We're in 1983 still. I remember playing this in the mid to late 80s. From single screen text choices into like dynamic platform worlds. And this was Jetpack, which kind of has the ingredients of a world, but it's abstracted in space to create its own kind of language. Um, and then we go into Manic Miner, um, which is where platform games come in. You probably remember Mario and things, but this is kind of where it started with games like this. A bit more complex and imaginative, but they still remained in a kind of an unreal place, which relied a lot on imagination and absurdity. Um, there is a semblance of architecture here. There's corridors, there's floors, there's ladders, but it's kind of surreal and twisted and still asking or inviting you to imagine a lot. And then this game, which was mind-blowing at the time in the late 80s, Elite, um, it blew the whole games world wide open, and it kind of led to games like, um, well, directly led to games like Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead Redemption and EVE Online. It was the first open world adventure, um, a space trading game in which users could explore thousands of galleries, galaxies. Um, and it might look kind of a bit distant and ancient now, as it is a bit, as I am, but it was on 48 kilobytes of data. This is Thousands of Galaxies, an incredibly deep, rich game, um, which is about one-ninth of the size of the JPEG, which is being projected right now. So incredibly, incredible technology emerging a lot. Um, Prince of Persia, um, which was kind of the forerunner to Assassin's Creed um, from the same production company. 
Um, and slowly we start to enter this realm of recreating architecture, human-centric spaces, architectural ingredients, blocks, bricks, um, recognizable kind of territories. And then this, for me, is where it really kicked off. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. This is kind of everyone that really, or a lot of people that get into architecture or urban planning started off with one of the SimCity games, especially from my generation. Um, I first came across this game in 19... 91, I think, and I was on a school exchange in northern Italy, in the Veneto, um, in a little town called Rovato. And I didn't know, because I was 11 years old, um, I didn't know that all around me were Palladio's villas and palaces, uh, palazzos, and incredible architecture, which I would then go on years later to study and teach and understand. Because on the first day of my exchange, um, I found my exchange student uh, colleague had SimCity, which I'd never played before. So I basically spent most of the week playing SimCity, and I came away from the Veneto knowing an awful lot about North American um, horribly car-centered urban design, and very little about Italian Veneto Palladio. Um, but it was great fun, and when I got home, I made my parents get me a copy. Um, and this came out shortly later, which is a game, or not really a game, it was more like a programming tool called 3D Construction Kit. And, you know, a decade before I probably started to use MicroStation and AutoCAD and various systems at university and in architecture practice, again, this is still on 48 kilobytes, which is less than an email. Uh, and you could design in 3D and set cameras to move around it and create kind of um, three-dimensional worlds, which was fairly mind-blowing. I was hopeless at it. Still always was hopeless at it. It's one of the reasons why I left architecture. Uh, couldn't draw in computers to save my life, but it was still mind-blowing, and it really made me think about three-dimensional space. But back to SimCity, because it is a really important game, and what I'm interested in is how it's changed, um, our, um, or how computer games, and through SimCity, to think about how we change our relationship to the urban and landscape. Um, so we can see through SimCity, we start with this godlike top-down, where you are a god and you pick and move things around in this um, plan model. And then we go into this isometric vantage, where it's still cartoony, we're in 1993 now. Um, you're still kind of a bit distant, but gaudy, but there's a little bit more detail going on. And slowly over the years, the perspective changes. The individual becomes uh, more related to the architecture, to the cityscape, um, and the agency and the um, uh, involving involvement with the world. And by the time we get to 2003 and SimCity 4, processor and graphical technology has moved on so much and places are starting to look a lot more realistic but we're getting in detail and you're seeing things until you get to uh, the most recent SimCity which is about a decade ago and was a very strange really crap game but you were down at street level and you've really got that first person so we've gone in this kind of sweep from a top down into the first person and into quite a realistic oh sorry into quite a realistic um kind of relationship to place. It's cartoony, it's over the top, and it's, you know, it's hyper-imaginative, but it's believable. And obviously along all this time as well, there was more data getting thrown in and being able to map and read the city in these ways in, through the game, a gamified situation, but it kind of reflects, I think, the way cities have gone now and the way that cities are managed and controlled as well, which we'll come on to later. Um, you can see it in other games too, Grand Theft Auto, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Again, started off with this top-down vantage when it was based in London back in 1997 in the first version. And by the time it had moved to Los Angeles or Los Santos in 2013, we're down at this street level, third-person perspective. So it's, it's a common movement in gaming, but also in computers and technology and um, our relationship to the kind of the picturing of the environment as well. And it was interesting to me because when I happened to go to LA in 1990, 2017, sorry, um, I was walking around Venice Beach and I had this sudden moment of like, I've been here before, I recognize it. And also this uncanny feeling of being able to know how to navigate the city, which is a very strange, weird, massive city anyway, but knowing how to get around and feeling it, like just uncannily reading the place. And I'd never been there before and I didn't really know a lot about it. Um, but I'd played Grand Theft Auto, and there is this kind of interesting relationship that it had imbued a certain sense of knowledge because of its cartoony, but a realism which was kind of in the place. And 
there's a nice paper by um, Atkinson and Willis, which talks about this overlapping of digital and physical reading of space. Um, when the player puts down the controller and turns off their screen, they return to the real, but carry with them this residue of the virtual experience and the actions that they have carried out within. And they call this the segue, which is, quote, a sustained interpretation of the real urban environment. And then they call the slip a temporary interpretation of an element of real urban context in the language, narrative, or physical constructs of the game world. So I think there are these interesting things to think about in relation to the real and the virtual. Um, in both the engagement and the involvement, but also the image of and the sort of picturing of. And as I say, there's, maybe there's nothing wrong with escape. In the history of all games, analog and digital, whether it's a board game or whether it's a high-res computer game, it's all about kind of putting yourself in a different situation, escaping um, to test something, to test yourself, or just to escape. Um, as this one, who I do love watching, so this lady, I love watching Gamergram, um, who had just had to pay a huge gas bill to British Gas and then took the anger out here. Hello, what do you do for a living? Work for British Gas, do you? You wanker. I'll give you put my bills up. Bust it back. You take that. You won't put them up no more. Bang! One for you and one for you. I'll give you one as well. You come here. I'll get you, you bastard. Come back. I'll give you central eating. You want central eating, babe? You've got it. Oh, yeah. You take that. Oh, take my fucking money out the ball. That's enough, Game of Grand. Um, but I think escape's not a bad thing. Um, it makes you question the real world you're in, um, but also it gives you opportunities to uh, expand your consciousness or your being. And there is also a notion in the real world, in the physical world, that certain groups or identities might flourish in the digital, um, perhaps do so because they are forced from the real world because of systems or politics, um, which don't allow them into the physical realm, into the, into the space which previously was civic or public. So you, you have to ask who is designing our physical space? Who is it being designed for? Who are they excluding? And what are the politics of place? You know, Skate Free is a hugely popular computer game and lots of people playing it. Maybe should be playing in the city, but the city is built with lots of anti-skating, hostile architecture. Um, so as we think about how virtual spaces are made, or even how future physical imaginaries are rendered and imaged and communicated to us, um, we have to think who they're being designed for and who do they exclude. So, cybernetics, which is the second keyword of the uh, title. <clears throat> it's a word which carries various meanings. Um, but an important definition is by Norbert Wiener, um, an American writer from 1948, um, who wrote this book, um, Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. And it's a long quote, um, but I'll read it because he kind of talks about this idea of cybernetics as feedback systems in biological, social, control and information systems. At every stage of technique since Daedalus or Hero of Alexandria, the ability of the artificer to produce a working simulacrum of a living organism has always intrigued people. This desire to produce and to study automata has always been expressed in the terms of the living technique of the age. So in the days of magic, we have the bizarre and sinister concept of the golem, that figure in clay into which the rabbi of Prague breathed in life with the blasphemy of the ineffable name of God. In the time of Newton, the automation becomes the clockwork music box, and with the little effigies of pirouetting stiffly on top. In the 19th century, the automation is a glorified heat engine, burning some combustible fuel instead of the glycogen of the human muscles. And finally, he says in 1948, the present automation opens doors by means of photocells or points guns to the place at which a radar beam picks up an airplane or computes the solution of a differential equation. So he was writing this at the early days of the sort of technological, technological renaissance of the last 80 years or so. Um, but it did coincide with lots of other things happening in the world, especially in the world of culture and art and visual rendering. Um, the art world was changing in the 1950s and late 1940s, and how we perceive and consider the world around us was shifting too. Art was coming off the canvas, politics was shifting, culture was becoming something new, and technology was infusing every facet of life in new ways. Uh, this was an exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery in uh, London, which was quite seminal. Um, Richard Hamilton 
the artist who made the cover of the book, um, which is called Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing, um, is the first pop art image. It's where the word pop art comes from. Um, before it kind of went Atlantic and into Andy Warhol and, and the larger American pop art scene. So within this image, you already see technology in the home, technology and consumerism and capitalism and idealization. Um, and Raina Bannum, who was a writer at the time, and you probably know from writing about architecture, some of you, um, wrote of, of the exhibition, viewers are invited to enter strange houses, corridors, and mazes. This is modern art to entertain people. Modern art is a game people will want to play. So there's this aura, this era of art and creativity moving beyond the pictorial and into immersive, immersivity, world building, and active experience. Just a few years later um, was this exhibition, Cybernetic Serendipity, at the ICA in London, but then it traveled across America, went on a tour as well. Digital had been entering the art world, um, but in 1968, it really hit the art world at this exhibition. Um, it's a fusion of art and technology. And as with This Is Tomorrow, just a few years before, it was a real shift of modern art um, from its traditional practices and the canon of fine art. It was an exhibition which invited play, like loads of the, ex the exhibits in this exhibition were involving people or technology or buttons or engagement, um, involved lots of te technological interaction and computer generated still and moving images. Including this, which I think is worth thinking about when we think about all of the conversations at the moment about chat GBT and AI and kind of pattern recognition forms of um, what's called artificial intelligence. This is Mondrian experiment by Michael Knoll, who is an artist based at Bell Labs in America. And it's an algorithmic, algorithmically computer generated art, which was designed to mimic Pierre Mondrian's artwork. So both were put up next to each other on the wall, uh, the AI generated one and then Piet Mond or an image of Piet Mondrian's original work. And then the public were invited to guess which was the AI generated work and which was the original human. Uh, the public overwhelmingly thought that the AI work was not only by Mondrian, but it was also the better of the two. Um, so it was an early sort of gamified exploration of AI and something we're getting quite familiar with today. Um, and this is another work, which is by Charles Suri, um, and it was created, it's called Random War. It was created on IBM 7094 computer, and it was made while the Vietnam War was still raging. And he made a drawing of one toy soldier, and then created a computer program to randomly generate um, 400, randomly, randomly generate 400 numbers and distribute 400 of these characters across the screen, um, which was then printed, um, as either red or black, two sides of an imaginary battle. And then upon that, the algorithm also assigned real names of soldiers along with deaths, medals, wounded and missing. And he said of the project, <coughs> random war is an imaginary war one with few variables, but it is only a short step to a real situation with the introduction of many more variables into the computer. So he was making this game, an image game, but was thinking about how technology and AI and algorithms and technology would fuse into the reality of war and other violent situations. Um, by 2002, First-person computer, first-person shooter computer games um, had quite developed through Doom and Quake and and so on, and had moved into quite real-looking landscapes. The U.S. Army developed this game, America's Army. It was a video game created on Unreal Engine, um, and it acted as a game, and it was a, a first-person shooter game. It based you 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 were a soldier in the American Army, but it was also a political statement and a tool of recruitment, and it could literally recruit like 16-year-olds from their bedroom. And then at the end of the game, an advert for the military and would recruit them to the battlefield. Um, I think if it works, there's an advert playing. All right, go through the door. Go, 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 go. All right, to the left. You look like you're really into this. You guys want a real challenge? As a soldier in the United States Army, you'll find out what you're really made of and how far you can go. Explore over 150 careers, help pay for college, and learn if you qualify for an enlistment bonus. Call 1-888-395-ARMY now for a free copy of the America's Army game and this new interactive DVD. Hear what it's like to be a soldier from real soldiers. You ready to take this to the next level? Call now to find out how you too can become Army strong. So, you know, it's quite scary. Um, behind the fun, beautiful graphics and quite realistic simulated landscapes can sit quite profound political control and propaganda. 
uh, landscape and architecture is by now somewhat realistically a simulacra of our world, and indeed in military games can even replicate exact locations, military projects, or even potential future military projects which you want to instill into the brain of the next generation of soldier. Uh, the intersection of video games and power, politics and propaganda is really interesting, too long for this talk, but if it is something that interests you, you should really watch. There's a series of art films by Harren Furoki called Serious Games. They're really excellent and they really explore this overlap between power, video game and military and explore drones and handheld communications and kind of indoctrination and propaganda and race. So the picturesque. Quite different elements, sorry. They'll all come together at the end, I, I think, I hope. Um, European landscape underwent quite a radical shift with the work of landscape designer André Le Notre. The Palace and Gardens of Versailles is a prime example, just outside Paris. For Louis XIV, uh, he used long geometric vistas to not only manifest a top-down system of man-made power over nature and through that, the population, but to do so with sight lines which appeared to go on as far as the eye could see. So this idea of a straight line which continued beyond the boundaries of the sight forever, professing an ultimate godlike power and controlling where the eye and the body can move through space. So if we look at Versailles on the left from 1632, the Versailles which Le Notre inherited before Louis XIV decided to uh, rather vastly expand, um, it's rotated, but you can see the vast expansion of the landscape and the geometry and the kind of rigid system of uh, man's ownership of nature, which, um, which went on and on over such a vast expanse. 36,000 men were used to build uh, the gardens of Versailles, and at least 1,000 died in the process. Um, efforts to get enough water to make the fountains work, the celebrated fountains, which are quite incredible and beautiful and a tourist attraction now, um, but there were so many of them, nearly bankrupted France. And although it was kind of violent in its act and caused so much death, it did still bring a lot of technological development, a lot of the skills we have now in horticulture and landscape um, planting and process came from Versailles. Um, but it was designed, it came from a design which is kind of quite vulgar and violent. And for instance, every morning, all of the plants would be changed. So it was forever spring. So all of the plants every morning would be changed overnight. So every morning it would look identical, spring-like, which meant huge technolog technological advances in greenhouses and different seasonal planting had to take place to keep this mirage of kind of eternal spring. Um, in Britain, it was no different. Landscape in Britain at uh, this time was made up of medieval arable system of open fields in which strips of land were managed by tenants and landowners. Uh, large areas of heaths and moors were owned as common land with rights for everybody to graze animals, forage and source peat or turf. And from the 15th century onwards, this quite delicate and deeply ingrained social system was under pressure from an act called enclosure. Uh, the process by which an emerging market-led agriculture system was becoming dominant, dominant over a tight ecosystem of small peasant producers and community farming. An enclosure came about when landowners who were rich and prominent uh, and often either the ruling classes or quite closely connected to the political classes petitioned Parliament to take ownership of common land, saying that they could improve them, they could run them better, they could run them more effectively. In, a sense, in essence, it was a huge, huge privatisation process, which didn't stop until the early 1900s, 1911, technically, um, by which land was removed from common use to the hands of just a few people. Um, politicians of the same class and outlook as those who petitioned to take ownership of the public land were pretty happy to award the better and larger lands, creating a nation of peasants who owned no land and had the scraps remaining after enclosure. So a small number of wealthy estate owners and then a huge class of rural labourers who were dependent upon those, uh, the, the unequal few for work and sustenance. So vast lands were acquisitioned by those in power. And we can see here the enclosures in Britain by the state for those in power, which ended common ownership, but also turned working land into a space of not only improved agriculture, but a lot of that land for entertainment and leisure and the luxurious gardens of those um, wealthy political few. 
So if we think back to the Versailles of La Notre, this is kind of what followed in England. And this is Stowe Gardens. It's an incredible, beautiful landscape. It's one that I worked on when I used to work in conservation architecture for a few years. Um, and it is beautiful, but it's fascinating. But of course, with beauty comes you know, an understanding of where that beauty comes from. You have to look underneath the turf. You have to look beyond the hedge to see what's there. Um, so when such grandiose landscaping came into fashion in Britain, the wealthy British class, who now owned huge amounts of land, more than they really knew what to do with, because they'd taken ownership of it, desired grandiose land landscaping schemes themselves. They tweaked that French model of Le Notre with its strong geometry and top-down, godlike uh, state. Uh, so this is Stoke Gardens. It was commissioned by Richard Temple, who was a politician and a mentor to the future Prime Minister, William Pitt the Younger. Um, the most well-known landscape designer to exploit this new industry of huge new gardens was uh, Lancelot Capability Brown. Named, he was commonly known, his real name's Lancelot, but he chose the nickname for himself Capability because it was part of his marketing scheme to tell everyone that he was the most capable person to employ to do this. Um, you know, he's like the Bjark Ingalls of his day, I guess. And uh, he, was, he had incredible business cards and he was very good at networking. And he made a lot of money. Um, so in 1741, uh, age 24, he became the head gardener at Stowe Gardens. Um, he set about implementing his new idea of landscape in which classical form was centered, that idea from Notre, was balanced with this idea of undulating, softly considered vistas, which were softer than the Baroque geometry from the French model. And general compositions were formed around these momentary framed act, uh, aspects, like viewing. So you'd walk around and stop and there'd be a framed vista, and that would capture you, and then you'd go on another walk around the circuit and find another framed view. So we can see here again the scale, this twisted, but um, before Capability Brown got his hands on it is the area at the bottom, and obviously then, as we saw with Versailles, vastly expanded, but slightly more playful and softer. We can see here the topology of the landscape as well. And when you see this in place, it looks a bit different. It's got this more softer, flowing, undulating uh, relationship. Um, so it's a softened geometry to imply a fusion with an existing landscape and nature. Less of this impression of we are controlling and more like what the word he used, we're improving nature. So more than the landscapes of Lenotre, which were about this clear imposition upon nature and about visible control, Brownian landscapes had the look of a softer touch, while really were actually came from really violent physical earthworks and heavy engineering. Um, but to give this gentle, soft of sublime, fluid gentleness. So in the making of Stowe Gardens that we're looking at here, Capability Brown demolished four villages with populations living in them, uh, just completely removed them, um, required huge physical violence. His schemes often required the damming of rivers, the complete flattening of hills, moving and creation of hills in other places, ripping out trees that have been there for 100 years or planting in non-native species which just looked better to him, um, and huge amounts of destruction. In Stowe, um, not far from here, just to the side, I think this side, was a little village called Lamport, uh, which had always been considered by the landowners going back hundreds of years because they could see it from the house, they could see it from their state rooms. Um, it was always considered a blight on the landscape, ugly. Um, so when Capability Brown came up with the idea of, well, why don't we just get rid of it, and then improve the view with, it's, it's not here, it's further along the lake, it's um, a Palladian bridge, which is another framed view. Um, everybody considered it an improvement to the landscape, though I think those who lived in Lamport before were less sure about that. So in 1748, a priest and a writer called William Gilpin published a book about Stowe Gardens, and he mused upon the aesthetics, and, the de and he developed an idea called the picturesque, which is where this word comes from. A lot of people associate it with the Capability Brown landscapes, but it kind of comes just after it, but it talks about them, and it talks about an evolution from them. Um, this theory developed over about 10, 15, 20 years, and he published a book outlining his ideas of picturesque beauty, which related the reading of landscape with that of making and reading visual images. And it was where the real first conflation, like academically and critically, of landscape and the image of landscape came together. Um, in that book, he wrote, um, in an essay on prints, 
containing the remarks of, oh, sorry, the book was called An Essay on Prints, containing remarks upon the principles of picturesque beauty. And it was a guide in how to read and create paintings or drawings, considering the landscape with picturesque qualities, where picturesque was defined as, quote, a term expressive of that peculiar kind of beauty which is agreeable in a picture, which is a loose term. So we'll go into what that means. Um, at the same time as these theories were coming together and landscape design was evolving, lots of the lander gentry and the wealthy, um, rich white men, were traveling around Europe going on what was called the Grand Tour, going to Venice, going to Rome, um, all of the classical Greece, all of the classical um, uh, cities and civilizations and architectures and ruins. And as they traveled Europe, especially around the classical Italian cities. They returned with ideas and drawings of grand European gardens, often taking with them Gilpin's book of how to look at landscape as well. This idea you'd take it as a travel guide and you'd, it would teach you how to read landscape and then you would um, replicate that in your drawing and then if you had a garden, replicate it within your garden as well. And slowly the English landscape gardens began to incorporate objects and approaches picked up from the Grand Tour. Statues, grottos, simulacra of sublime nature-like waterfalls or cliffs, terraces and parterres, overgrowth, ruination. Whereas previously, if we go back, think back to the Capability Brown, all of those architectural elements like the Palladium Bridge or the, the Grand Towers were all kind of quite strong, perfectly formed, classical um, architectures, imposing stature and importance upon landscape. When, it got through to the picturesque, there was a sense of ruination and a sense of collapse, such as in the picture here like by Claude Lorraine, who was hugely influential. And there was also how-to guides and discussions about how you would actually replicate that into your own project. So you can see on the left here, um, this is what a capability brown, a hypothetical capability brown garden landscape would look like, and here is how it would be turned into a picturesque, which is still highly managed, highly controlled, still quite violent in its creation, still needs a lot of management and manicuring, but to create this image of looseness, roughness. And when the travelers of Europe on the Grand Tour um, came back to England, they didn't just bring back visuals and pictures and memories of the landscapes and the architectures and the history, but they also brought back a fear of revolution and political uprising that was happening across Europe, including in France, um, across the, all of the 18th century. And they were worried it would happen in Britain as well. And this fed into this idea of the picturesque. Um, this is a reaction to the stiff order, this godlike top-down order of Capability Brown, and it invoked this rougher feel, which looked more overgrown. It looked more wilderness. It added ruination to imply progress, collapse, rebuilding. But it was still, as I say, inherently tightly managed and controlled environment. And it ran parallel to a contemporary political concern of this revolutionary action, which the upper classes were fearful that the British lower classes, who had been kicked out of their landscapes, um, would rise up like was happening in France and other European countries, as witnessed on mainland Europe. So politics was being similarly reshaped to present this image of a less paternalistic, less top-down, less controlling, more participatory, more liberal idea of politics, while it was really still strongly structured to benefit the ruling and landed classes. Oofdale Price, who was a writer of the picturesque, said at the time, a good landscape is that in which all the parts are free and unconstrained, but in which, so I've got this on the next slide actually, sorry. A good landscape is, um, is that in which all the parts are free and unconstrained, but in which though some are prominent and highly illuminated, and others in shade and retirement, some rough and others more smooth and polished, yet they are all necessary to the beauty, energy, effect and harmony of the whole. And then he goes on to say, I do not see how good government can be more exactly defined. And as this definition suits every style of landscape from the plainest and simplest to the most splendid and complicated and excludes nothing but the tameness and confusion, but tameness and confusion. So it equally suits all free governments and only excludes anarchy and despotism. So there is this overarching notion that both private landscapes and government were designed so that Oofdale Price and other ruling classes who were designing and 
thinking about such things could shift power from a top-down didactic government to one which appeared more natural and democratic, but would still remain wealthy while the poor um, were simultaneously acknowledged but kept in their place and in their role in a system, as nature here would look natural, look free, but would still be contained within a mediated park experience um, to suit a picture or an ex experience for those who take pleasure from it. We can see here how um, some of the ideas from the Grand Tour have literally folded back in. On the left, we have a lovely picture by Salvatore Rosa from 1665, which would have been seen by a lot of people traveling on the Grand Tour and was seen by the owner of um, Bowood House in England, um, who then, when he came back, um, who'd already got a capability brown landscape, but when he came back, wanted to infuse it, a picturesque style into his landscape. So he employed Charles Hamilton and Josiah Lane, um, showed them a copy of Salvatore Rosa's picture and asked them to make a version of it. So this was a literal copying of a painting of, an, of, a, of this landscape, domesticated and kind of made with fake rocks, tufa rocks, I think, and then a channeled stream and a more British, smaller scale, domestic scale. Um, but still coming with it that idea of the sublime and control of nature. And so what, you might think, that this is just a story about some wealthy people decorating their garden with statues and so on. But it does have more sinister and more political overtones. This is a language, um, the language of the picturesque was powerful and could be used to conceal all kinds of violence. So this is a book I found in the British Library for some research for something else, and it's called a picturesque tour of the island of Jamaica, and it's from 1825. Jamaica was owned by Britain at that time. It was a slave owned, it was, a, it was an island that we were using for slave plantations, for industry, for profit. Um, and this book came out at the same time as there was huge calls in the British politics and from the general population to stop the slave trade. Um, not all the politicians. Some of them were benefiting financially and personally very well from the slave trade and were fighting against it. So this book came out um, to kind of present this pastoral, romantic, naturalistic, beautiful postcard view of Jamaica. This idea of Britain having improved the place. We've built bridges. We've built lovely little European houses. We've created this lovely picturesque romantic landscape. There were people sometimes tending the fields and sometimes they're smiling and carrying things. It's a really sinister book. Each one of these pictures has kind of a small text which acts like a little bit of a marketing text. This particular plantation held 1,100 slaves upon stolen land and they were working to cultivate sugar with huge returns and profit to both the landowner and the British state. Similarly, this picture, which is not of a plantation, but it's of a waterfall um, and, and the text under it reads, the fall is formed by the junction at its head of the Cane and Lucky Valley rivers, which unite within a hundred yards of the spot, from whence they are precipitated into the gulf beneath from a height of somewhat more than 200 feet. The road is tolerably good, having been formed with much labor for the traffic of mules, for the supply and convenience of the estates and coffee mountains, which abound in its neighborhood. So there is this idea of the romantic, sublime picturesque. This is an incredible scene. It is a picturesque scene, but it's one that we've controlled a bit. We've, we've earned a lots of labor. We've built a path through it. We've managed it. We've tamed it so that we can get access to these incredible coffee mountains. But whose labor, whose profit, whose land, whose mountains? This is a capitalistic and imperial ownership of people and land. And here it's presented in a picturesque style to soften that violence. So we need to look beneath the picturesque image, both the landscape itself, but also the picture of the place. And I'll take it more modern as well, because I still think it's something that we can think about in modern day. It's not just historical. Um, I don't think the violence image and this decoy of the picturesque is something just from history, but it's something that I think leads to how we make and think about space today. This is the Haygate Estate in Elephant and Castle, which is near where I live in South London. This was built in the early 1970s. Um, really big, quite beautiful in places, slab block housing. 3,000 people lived in a huge area here, very, very central London, about 20 minutes walk to Covent Garden, so quite central. Um, 1,214 homes, 
social and affordable community housing. All of it was social housing, no private ownership. Slowly some came private owned, about 150, but social housing, council housing. And it was all set within a public park, huge public park with fully grown trees, a forest. It was the only forest in central London. It's true it was suffering from mismanagement, partially deliberately by the council because they didn't want to put money into the estate. It was the wrong kind of people. Uh, they didn't like the architecture. They'd rather put their money into the South Bank and the art galleries and the more wealthy parts of the area. Um, but they were solid buildings. There was a really solid community. It could have been rescued. It could have been sustainable. It could still have been there, but it wasn't. It isn't. Um, this is the scheme that was promised in its place. This is called Elephant Park. When developments come in, they often take a bit of the name of what was there before and um, rebrand it. Um, so the 3,000 residents that lived there before had been shown images like this, and they were promised that in this new development that was coming, they would all get new homes. And who can turn down an image like this? It's beautiful. It's picturesque. Um, over time, sadly, those 3,000 residents were only offered 92 flats. That's now what there is. Um, in the finished development, 92 flats at affordable or council level for the existing residents. Every single other resident who lived there has been dispossessed. Some into London, others a lot further, south of the England, Midlands, elsewhere. And as that happens, um, kids change school, people lose their neighbours, support networks break. Um, it's people um, just lose the community that has been there for generations and generations. Um, it was sold on images like this render, which you're all familiar with. I'm, I'm particularly familiar with. I look at them a lot. Um, but we see them on hoardings, in marketing, in newspapers, in TV programs. Every single property in phase one of this new development, which did have 3,000 Londoners who lived there and had done since 1972, every single property in phase one was sold to an offshore investor in Asia, um, largely to be left empty as an investment just to flip in five or ten years' time. Um, some as offshore landlords just to rent. Um, so properties which were worth 180,000. People, the people that lived there were given compulsory purchase orders if they owned their flat, and they were given about 180 to 200,000 pounds, but given first refusal on the new flats, which started about 600,000 pounds. So it was a deliberate political um, dispossession. And I think it's interesting to look at this in relation to this image. Um, this is, on the left, this is the same location that's as built. So I'm interested in this relationship between the promise, the render, the future imaginary, and then what's built. It's fine, it's nice, I suppose. You know, it's not the same to me as the forest that was there, but it certainly isn't this. You know, this is the trickery of image. And we, we're all familiar with it. Is it a lie? Is it just marketing? Is it just the architectural ambition? I don't know, but it's not that. Um, what's more interesting to me is on the right is the street view. Um, and so previously where there was a forest and you could just walk off the road and into the woods and anyone could walk around, now it's lifted up and the only people that get access to this area are the people that live in that space. So it's become privatised too. It was all publicly owned land, it's now private, it's been enclosed as well. So we're seeing the same patterns of violence, dispossession and enclosure. Fewer people live there. Um, the working class community who were there dispossessed um, but the developer behind it, Lend Lease, an Australian company, have made hundreds of millions of pounds of profit. Interestingly, the council <clears throat> actually have made £50 million loss, partly because they're idiots, partly because um, they, they spent all the money on the feasibility studies and on the demolition process. So they paid for the demolition, they cleared the land, and then they sold it to the developer just for peanuts. It was a political agreement between the council and Lendlease, and Lendlease have done very, very well out of it, and London hasn't, I would argue. Um, and it has real impact upon people. It's architectural violence, social and political violence, and it's enclosure of public space for private benefit. The council lost £50 million, as I said, and privately owned flats, which now sell for millions of pounds. Um, and, you know, this was written in 2022, so it's still impacting people. Why does it matter? You know, in a visual-led culture, these kinds of images are familiar. We see them all the time. We know that finished architecture, like this scheme by Renzo Piano for London, would never look like this in the finished. Why does it matter? Because we can read through it. We're architects, or we work with these images, right? 
And here are some you might know. So I don't think it's just London. And I'm not critiquing here the projects. You know, I'm talking about this language of image making. I know bits of some of these projects in Vilnius, but I don't know them as deeply as you guys do. I'm not saying they're all bad projects, but it's become this universal aesthetic, this sublime sunset, translucency, trees, landscape roughage, and implied civic generosity. Um, and I'm interested more in the image of them, the image of this proposed future, this romantic future. But by looking at them, can we tall ourselves up to read beneath the images and to read other people's plans for us and our places and to critically question what's beneath? Because the way these images work to present an imagined future, often a technological advanced or an improved future, improving our future, they say, is reliant upon these images. So it's worth thinking about how and why images look like this. What is their history and function of this flat image we're looking at? Go back one, sorry, I put one ahead. Because um, they woo us, they woo the public and the political audience, and deep down we know they might not look like this, in this light-filled, hazy, singular bunch. I think this one, Zaha Hadid, at the business stadium project. They're unquestionably alluring, and they're an extension of this conflation of place and image of place, um, which I think is born from the picturesque. But who are they working for, and who are they building for? And in a culture where architecture is perceived as skin deep, this image is primary, these sort of renders, and we are only interested in the picture, not the depth, not what's behind. So the image kind of often does the work more than the building. And when the rich sublime, which is possible in the kind of modern technology and digital possibilities we have nowadays, um, can be proposed as real, even for projects like this, which just as a student entry for project will never get built, but they, they look like they exist or they could exist. What does that mean for the future? These dreamlike futures that may or may not be physically or technologically possible. Um, and they're working less to present actuality, but just an aura, an allure, or this escape from reality. And they can conceal other violences, just as the real landscapes we've looked at do. They can conceal politics, inequalities, environmental destruction, and the picturesque can still be deployed to soften the passage and dress up what lies beneath. So it's no surprise that architectural propaganda comes from these same technologies used within video games to create the picturesque in games like these. Open world built natural landscape simulacres which present idealized, romanticized, cartoon but ideal versions of reality and are everyday familiar. They use programs like Unreal Engine, um, CryEngine, Twinmotion, Unity. And they're all now used in architectural design and rendering companies as well, you probably use them, to develop, but they came from video games. Games also use 3D Studio Max and AutoCAD in their development, so these worlds are overlapping. And I think it comes together quite interestingly in Notre Dame. After the tragic fire a few years ago of Notre Dame in Paris, the historians of Paris contacted Ubisoft to ask them to see their data and the files of their version of Notre Dame, because they'd gone into such depth and accuracy in the recreation of the cathedral although it's semi-accurate, there was benefit for the historians and the architectural conservators and the research team to, to, to draw from their models. So there was a real overlap in that instance. Okay, we're coming now to the conflation of these two. He says, keeping an eye on the time. Where do I think these come together? So this idea of evoking a world beyond into a more intimate, personal space of Escape and exploration isn't new. This idea of escape isn't new. But we're normalized now to unforeseen levels of simulated reality and digital displacement. Technology has fueled the realism and escapism of digital versions of the world, while it's also increasingly being folded into the very physical future imaginaries themselves. We know these things are not going to get built. This is the walkie-talkie building in London, which if you've been to London, you might have seen a big Raphael Vignoli building. It was sold as having in the planning statements having London's tallest park um, at the top, and that's why it got through planning. In a part of the city, it was illegal for it to be built in, it was against planning regulations, it was blocking historic views through Tower Bridge. It shouldn't have been built there, but it only got built because of the promise of this image on the left, this park, this public park. And this is what's got built. There's very few plants up there. It's mainly used for um, entertainment by the companies within the building. It's basically, in my view, an enclosure of, private, of public space, the public space there being sight lines and views and the airspace of the city rather than on the ground, but it's an enclosure of a public civic asset for private 
benefit. This is the Garden Bridge, which I spent a few years quite strongly involved with the opposition of, um, designed by Thomas Heverwick and Boris Johnson. It played so richly upon picturesque and sublime imagery like this. It never got built. Would it have looked like this if it got built? I doubt it from what I know about the project, and I know quite a lot. Um, it certainly wouldn't have cost anything like they said it was going to cost if it was going to look like this. Does it matter? The render exists. I know people that live not far from this site, and sometimes people have walked along the south back of the London with this picture on their phone, and they said, where can I find this bridge? Because they believe it to be real, because they've seen this picture of it, and they look so real. And maybe they want it to be real, um, and it doesn't. But maybe the image of it is enough for our kind of future imaginary, because our places are sold on this surface idea of a future ideal. This was an incredibly violent and political project, and such projects as this and the images of this can conceal, as I say, the politics, the violence, inequality, and dispossession. And our landscapes that are designed for a vague notional idea of the picturesque, from single framed views always, um, to conceal those issues. This is Sidewalk Toronto. Um, because our landscapes are also now increasingly being designed to conceal technology and entwine that technology into place and businesses and democracy and power. And I think we need to critically engage with images such as this to not just look beneath the surface of the image, but also inquire as to what's beneath the surface of the world which is represented within it. So Sidewalk Toronto, which also didn't get built, as you might well know, was always sold on these kind of picturesque romantic renders. But underneath is a cybernetic system of data management, paternalistic control, systemic observation, and an urban landscape of inequality. It was a physical manifestation of a surveillance capitalism. In fact, Jim Balsillie, the co-founder of Blackberry, he might have had ulterior motives for criticizing a Google project, but he spoke about it and called it, quote, a colonizing experiment in surveillance capitalism, attempting to bulldoze important urban, civic, and political issues. And in this city, everything was hardwired into data gathering and surveillance. The pavement, the lights, the cameras, every room, every time you used a card or moved into a space, looked at something, was going to gather. And who was it being built for? After reducing in scope and scale as Google faced public opposition, then political opposition and critical analysis, uh, they sought to rewrite legal and governmental frameworks to allow it to happen, but eventually just canceled the whole thing. And you might say, as we come to the final case study, this is all still a historical, it doesn't matter, that um, it didn't get built, Toronto, the Garden Bridge didn't get built, whatever, or the references are from 200 years ago. But where should we look for where it might mean? Where does this idea of the cybernetic picturesque end up? And I think maybe we look in that corner of Saudi Arabia. What is Neom? This is Neom. Or here, to be more precise, in the northwest of Saudi Arabia. But Neom is more than a place. It's a home for people who dream big. Bigger than that. That's more like it. It'll be a hub for innovation. An entirely new model for sustainable living. The vision for a new future. In fact, that's how it got its name. But what will be there? There's Oxagon, a thriving city at the crossroads of the world where advanced manufacturing will enable industries of the future. Trojana, a year-round mountain destination. And just remember to pack your skis when you visit. Or if skiing's not your thing, there's always Sindala, one of Neom's many beautiful islands, perfect for some R&R. &R. And the line, a 500-meter high, 200-meter wide, 170-kilometer long city in the shape of, well, a line. No roads, cars, or emissions and everything its nine million residents could ever need within a five-minute walk. But best of all, the entire region will offer unparalleled access to nature and will be powered by clean energy. All within easy reach of the rest of the world. I know what you're thinking. Why does the world need Neom? That's a good question. The world needs Neom because the world needs change. That's what we mean when we say... Made to change. Neom represents a global opportunity for one, changing how the world does business by making the region a special economic zone, easing the way for entrepreneurs to blaze their trail. Two, changing the way we live our lives with preventative healthcare and the highest standards of livability. Sounds nice, right? And three, 
changing how we look after nature and our planet. Because without this, what use are one and two? But how will NEOM achieve these aims, you may ask? Within NEOM are 14 sectors, spearheaded by the world's best talent. Each sector has been designed to advance technology and push the very limits of human knowledge. Hmm. Imagine NEOM as a prototype for a better future, a future for all. One being built to last. Sound good? Great. So when the world asks, what is NEOM? You'll know to answer that NEOM's a place that'll change the way we live on this planet. Simple, really. So, I wanted to play the whole thing. Um, it just came out a few weeks ago, that advert. Because I think, for me, it's equally hilarious and terrifying. I don't think it will get built. I don't think it is intended to get built. From what I hear about people involved with it and um, what um, the, the proponent of it is talking about. But it's worth talking about, because I think it brings a lot of these things together. And the intent is there. And certainly, if it doesn't get built, all of the main players who want it to get built will find ways to get their ideas out there. Um, so this is the line, which is part of those elements of neon, uh, as the advert nicely told us. A nonsensical line proposed by a lunch of dull techno men, not all from, but in Saudi Arabia. In fact, very few are from Saudi Arabia, mainly from Silicon Valley and Europe. A single architectural line, like the Sun Kings was at Versailles, but massive, controlling landscape, nature, and people as it passes through. <clears throat> And in doing so, we'll interrupt migration routes, historic landscapes, modern imposition on place that the Sun King could only dream of, migration routes of people and nature. It's architecturally desolate, but it exists solely because of a grotesque reliance upon surface sublime images um, and this picture-framed vantage, which presents itself as beauty, but again is concealing and reliant upon violence. Um, it all comes from Mohammed bin Salman, the 36-year-old crown prince, future king of Saudi Arabia. It has an initial budget of 500 billion US dollars. Um, it's an, in an area of over 38 degrees Celsius and without, with nearly no fresh water. In an interview with Bloomberg News, Mohammed bin Salman explained that Neom's most important innovation would be its legal framework. And he said that in a place like New York, there's an inconvenient need for laws to serve citizens as well as the private sector. But in Neom, he said, we have no one there. So as a result, you have regulations which are based upon the desires only of investors. And if I think I might have a clip in a moment of um, the launch event. Andy Wirth was an American hospitality expert who was hired to consult on this, the Trojana ski resort. Temperatures in Saudi Arabia at the top of the mountains do drop below freezing, but not nearly enough for skiing or this kind of snow laden landscape that you've had here over the last few months. Um, so huge amounts of tech would be needed. A proposed artificial lake would have, would, would, will or would require vast demolition of the landscape and infilling with water. A huge canyon formed by explosives would be home to this, the vault, um, which incidentally was aesthetically drawn from an Isaac Asimov story, The Foundation, which Apple TV have just made, made into a series, which um, Mohammed bin Salman, B MBS, enjoyed watching. And so he said, I want one of those. We couldn't even estimate the build cost, said Andy Worth, the hospitality guy. He said, we were hanging buildings on the sides of cliffs, and we didn't even know the geology. And after five months, he resigned. And I think everyone involved will resign. I think it's just they're hanging on as long as they can because it's huge amounts of money they're getting. Um, it's worth going to the NEON website. You'll get lost in it. It's this labyrinthine click hole that feels like it's more built about spam and kind of just, you know, trickery um, than a serious proposition, but it's, it's really fascinating. And there are some incredible claims. Quote, for the user, it will feel intuitive and predictive as if life itself has been simplified and enhanced. And there's all kinds of cybernetic statements like this, which conceal behind alluring cyberpunk influence picturesque imagery. Um, I'll play a bit of this. This is an edit I made of a, a two hour long, um, I watched it so you don't have to, a two hour long launch event of Neon at, um, in New York in 2017. There's just a couple of clips here. Your Highness, this is a very important point. And here, you're beginning from scratch. You have foreigners, foreign businesses watching. What do you need most to make this a reality? 
Starting from scratch is a unique thing, and this is what we concentrate on today, to plan a city with the technologies of tomorrow. There are many things that we cannot uh, uh, start unless we start from scratch, like uh, uh, whether the city is going to be a drone-friendly uh, city. Uh, today, there is no existing city that can uh, use drones because they lack the infrastructure, like parkings, uh, like the buildings need to be drone-friendly. So there are many things that uh, uh, will be taken care of in uh, uh, designing the city and transportation plans. Today, we don't know if the city will have cars or driverless cars or um, not cars at all, uh, depends on uh, different ways of mobility. This applies to uh, all other sectors. So there is an opportunity to plan from scratch, to build a zone, a city, uh, starting from scratch. Like uh, Steve mentioned, nobody will be able to build something like Neom except in uh, one state, to demolish uh, an existing city and rebuild it. But no other city in the world can change to become a Neom in the future. So then, Your Highness, the regulation will be different. Indeed. The project today does not have any population, so the regulations will be formed in a way that uh, instigates and encourages the businesses. This is the first time in the world where uh, regulations are designed by business uh, uh, people in order to encourage them, encourage their business. So this is the first of such experience in the world that serves uh, business people to formulate their own uh, regulations and laws that serves them in, in this zone. That doesn't sound like a city I particularly want to live in. But interestingly, he did say that the, the area has no population. Nowhere is dead. We don't make new land. There is no tabula rasa, whether Elephant and Castle or La Notre or um, British enclosures. This area does. The Huaitit tribes are historically nomadic. Some members still are. And while most have settled in the villages across the territories Neom is set to drive across, um, many, many are still nomadic. Um, their land is being taken away, as well as the land of much nature. These are not dead spaces. Many are being brought out on promises of new life, paid to leave where their, their lives. Others are being imprisoned, and some are being sentenced to death. Um, the violence, like with Capability Brown and others, is hidden underneath that landscape, the technology and the picturesque imagery. And architects, who really should have a better ethical framework, both humanitarian and environmental, are all involved with this. Morphosis, Tom Main is the main architect behind the line, but lots of architects are involved with neon projects within, names you'll recognize. So it's worth looking into the promises of NEOM um, and its line project, even if, as I suspect, it will never get built. From a technological perspective, another quote, from a technological perspective, this means an interconnected, intelligent, resilient environment where everything works together holistically to provide personalized, predictive, immersive experiences enabled by autonomous, self-healing services that enhance daily life, is their sales pitch. That's just a cybernetic city. It's the things we saw Norbert Wiener talk about, but here built into our civic landscape, data and surveillance deeply embedded. Jan Patterson, who is in charge of the sports of NEON, said recently in an interview, quote, imagine a sixth grader, when he wakes up, his home will scan his metabolism. Because he had too much sugar, sugar the night before, the refrigerator will suggest porridge instead of the granola bar he wanted. Outside, he'll find a swim lane instead of a bus stop. Carrying a waterproof backpack, he'll breaststroke the way to school. Patterson actually means this. Neom is considering an idea for canals filled with swimmable water, creating a novel aquatic commuting option. Um, so it's spoken about as an entirely cybernetic cognitive city, which we will not be at one with, but subsumed into a place without even thinking or knowing. It's a place we need to question whose benefit and to whose profit and who's excluded, and who is removed to wake, make way for such utopia, and who controls the mechanisms and the agency of them. Um, I won't go into it, but have a look at Ton Autonomous, the spin-off company which Neom have created, which manages all of their technology, and has created a metaverse, obviously, which you can already buy your flat in Neom, in the metaverse, and um, find out your digitally, find out your neighbors you're going to live with when the thing gets built. Um, maybe, I presume, you can always take virtual reality floats in a canal and get force-fed porridge or something on the metaverse. And I see images like this on Twitter and social media. You know, this is someone who's written, 
after the El Clasico, the Spanish football game, was hosted in Saudi Arabia for money, this guy posted, an El Clasico final happened in Saudi Arabia today. Soon, these games are going to be played in this spectacular stadium at the Neon, uh, La Line at Neon. Not going to lie, I got hit with vertigo just from the model of this hanging stadium. I mean, Zulfakar, it's not. It's not going to happen in that stadium. I've watched a lot of football, and it will never happen there. But this imagery is persuasive, and it's exciting, and it's sexy. Um, and to come to a close, um, an entity called the Neon Morphority will govern the entire area appointed by MBS. And it might be expropriated from the rest of Saudi Arabia with a new, what's called a digital border, which only lets in those with permissions to access it. And so to think back to the picturesque, um, a quote from a writer called Simon Pugh, who wrote about the picturesque, who I've read before. And he's writing here about the picturesque, but I'm thinking about it in relation to things like Neon. And he wrote, the less visible corollary of this process is the domination of people for the control of nature was always and still is a metaphor for the control of people. The discourse around the garden, particularly in the crucial and formative period of the 18th century, as a paradigm for the representation of nature, prefigures much of the cynical opportunism of high capitalism by employing a rhetoric of naturalness, which disguises processes that are deterministic, institutional, and rational. The rationalization of, of the mysterious force of nature, the reinstitution of myth as ideology, which purports to commodify the mythic power of nature, is evident in the misuse of environment, a legacy of destruction that may be irreversible. And that was in 1998, talking about the picturesque, but I think we can talk about it now. So I'm going to close with a quote from Norbert Wiener, who wrote that book in 1948 on cybernetics, who maybe didn't think of it in relation to built cybernetics, civic cybernetics, but was aware of the risk of emergent ideas um, of fusing humanity with machine at the same time as writing about its potential. And he wrote, thus, on all sides, we have a triple construction of the means of communication, the elimination of the less profitable means in favor of the more profitable, the fact that these means are in the hands of the very limited class of wealthy men and thus naturally express the opinions of that class, and the further fact that, as one of the chief avenues to political and personal power, they attract, above all, these, these ambitions for such power. So in 1948, when he was thinking about this rise of AI and technology and man's future connection to technology, he was aware that if you give the means of that technological production and ownership to the few people that control power or want to control the power, you are controlling the ownership of men humankind and people, um, and the risks of what that is. And as we descend into the metaverse and blockchain and AI and everything that we're talking about in the world outside, who will hold the power and the technology to create the imagery and the built future? What work are these images doing to present this future? What are they concealing? And who are they working for? And can we look backwards towards the picturesque and its visual representations as a method to think forward to the future cybernetic picturesque that is sold to us? And uh, I'll finish there. Thank you. There are, there are a couple of interesting things. One is that most of the picturesque you were presenting, both in um, games and in uh, uh, projects, are quite heavily based on greenery, which, uh, mm. which really is what uh, inspires us. Basically, I think this is what we as uh, humans want a lot. We want a, a lot more of nature in our cities. That's natural. But uh, at the same time, um, the real world examples, and we are witnessing this in Vilnius as well, are showing that, yeah, these promises aren't uh, happening too often. And uh, as you said, you know the saying, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So how does this work uh, in, the, in our perception or our evaluation? Why don't we recognize it? Why don't we... Uh, either demand the promises to be kept or somehow revolt ag against it. How does this work? Yeah, I mean, nature's an interesting one, isn't it? Because, um, like, we do. We need more nature, like, because we're, we've destroyed most of what there is. Um, it's just where, where do we put that nature? You know, I showed you those pictures of the 
garden bridge project in London, which didn't get built. That was really being sold upon an idea of, um, oh, we've got to put nature back into the city centre, into, you know, return to nature kind of thing. Um, there's already a lot of nature in London. The worst place you could possibly put nature is on um, a thousand tons of concrete and Glencore child mined metal bridge, which cost 250, would have cost 250 million pounds to support like 50 trees, when you could have planted a thousand trees around the M25 and around London and wherever, you know, without the concrete, without the metal. Um, it's the same when you look at buildings by Thomas Heverwick or Stefan Boeri, um, and you've, you're creating, you know, they're beautiful, they're sublime. The one in Milan, the Bosco Verticale, looks lovely, it's incredible, it's very photographable, Instagrammable. Um, but each one of those trees is supported by a huge concrete um, balcony. Um, underneath, the whole thing has kind of got this fence around it, and underneath is like a two-story car park for all the private owners to drive in and out because there's no sort of infrastructure around it. Well, people that live there don't shop and commute locally, they travel. So it's kind of, nature here is being used as a, uh, you know, like just a sublime aura to allow something to happen which wouldn't. Just like I showed you the walkie-talkie building with the nature at the top, you know, this idea of a jungle in the sky, what a romantic idea, but why not put a jungle on the ground? That's probably where it's best. Trees have been in the ground for many thousands of years, so maybe we should stick doing that. Um, lots of landscape architects and architects do do the right thing. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I think in one of those clips of Vilnius, there was a scheme there which I was talking to you about yesterday, which I think is quite landscape-led, and I think does have a lot of trees, and, and I'm not being critical of all of those schemes um, in them, and a lot of architects are now doing the right thing. And really, a lot of architects are now looking to doing things like reuse, adaptive reuse, rather than building something new, which beyond nature, I think, is the best thing that could be done, you know, um, for the future um, city-making. Yeah, but uh, your um, uh, maybe uh, I, I also wanted to put emphasis on the um, client sides, either public as a client or even a private or a flat owner or a contractor. I know, but, uh, uh, are we simply apolitical or I don't know indifferent to what happens after that? No, but I also think like. Um not everybody would know, and nor should they necessarily. Not everyone is trained as an architect or a landscaper or reading of history. And to most people, you see trees on a bridge or growing out the side of a building, you think that's wonderful. That's more nature, nature's returned. Um, but those who study it, and you guys who probably in the audience who make it, um, and are landscape architects or architects, um, might be able to see through some of that imagery and maybe it's our job as architects or communicators of architecture to try and get some of those messages across and at least start those conversations because um, the press certainly aren't doing it the clients and the developers are certainly not doing it a lot of the big named architects who lead the conversations and put out the sort of images out there or do projects like this like um, morphosis and people are doing aren't putting those messages out there there's a lot of good young organizations, I'm sure there's a ton in Vilnius, as well as Architectures Fondus, um, Fondus, which are bringing together discussions. Certainly in Britain, there's a lot of um, young architect-led radical protest groups and organizations to start these conversations and change from the inside, but also communicate to the outside. But I wouldn't blame the public. Um, and, you know, who is the client in architecture? My argument here is that the public is the future users, which is civic and citizen, but we're not the ones paying for it now, so we're not the ones being asked all the time. True. I saw a Paul was wanted to jump in. Hi. Uh, we see a division between the promise of the picture and uh, what we get in the real world. In, in in all of the examples, we see that none of the projects being realized resembled at least a part of, uh, of the vis visualization. But uh, I wonder if we move more and more into the virtual, and if we have, a, let's say, some sort of a screenshot of a virtual promise, and, and then uh, we can move into, into those 3D environments in any kind of, uh, let's say, whether that's metaverse or, or games, or uh, would, would you consider those environments as fulfilling the promise? Because it's a lot easier to, to, to create 
even even the line in the virtual world could be mm -hmm. easily rendered and it would take time but but we could make something which would look like the visualization and and people could move around or or do of course the full life is not available in virtual not yet. environment not yet <laughs> but but we could still at some like at least uh, explore those areas so I mean, yeah, I would say let all the people that want to do things like the neon line, let them do it in the metaverse and like leave the rest of the world <laughs> to, to the rest of us that don't. Um, I would say that I don't think that will get built. I think the digital one will get built, the digital twin, and then it will be like this weird orphan twin where the, the other one never came about. Um, because it's basically, you know, um, an image which physically can't really get built. If it did get built, it would cost billions, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of billions of dollars. Um, and there are way more, you know, they, they say they've started the foundational and the starting for infrastructure and they've already stumbled across the impossibility of doing it because they haven't really thought the whole thing through. And the people that are starting this conversation are not going to be there in two years because they've, they've retired and taken their money. Um, but the metaverse one probably will. And that, yeah, I mean, what, what is interesting perhaps in the metaverse and might take us away from this, um, picturesque image, which is about a static frame. It's always about this framed view from a singular point, which is used to sell architecture. If we, as a public, get more used to immersive environments and we might get to explore that tower block that's getting built, we can all experience it in our own time in a virtual thing for three months before it gets to planning permission. Um, so we can see what it's like and where the light falls and what it actually would look like in different weather and stuff. And maybe as a planning thing, there might be nice models to be made, which me, people can engage with a project in a much deeper way than relying on a single alluring image. But I think what might be more interesting in terms of technology and metaverse AI technology is if people could be involved in the process of shaping and making as well. I don't think it's happened too much in architecture yet. Maybe it is, and I'd love to hear things if anyone knows studies of where people have been engaging a future public or an existing community in using digital to actually make the space as well. I know it's been done in Minecraft and other kind of technology, but in actual three-dimensional things. I've seen it in art. I went to an exhibition recently, a really beautiful exhibition by a British um, uh, trans black artist called Danielle Braithwaite Shirley up in Liverpool. And she'd created this huge um, cyberpunk environment for um, these like 15 young people in Liverpool who had come together because all the youth clubs in Liverpool have closed down as they have across Britain because the government are increasingly right-wing and fascist and there are no youth centres, there's no sports facilities and so the youth in Liverpool, she created this kind of temporary youth club for them for over a year. They came together to develop computer games and narratives and stories and then she made them into these little glitchy games and then in the exhibition space has created this kind of huge cyberpunk playground where the public can go in. And when I spoke to her about it, um, she said, this, I don't want at the end of the gallery, end of the exhibition, this gallery to look remotely the same. I want the kids of Liverpool to come in and use it like the youth club that they don't have, to graffiti it, to play the games, to add things to it, to break things, or whatever, what kids do. And they're not allowed to do in the street, and they don't have their own spaces to do it. And I think, although that's an art example, and it's a playful, provocative one, the more that we can engage people in the making of their own imaginaries, whether it's in games and play or whether it's in actual architectural projects and finding ways for people to get engaged with it, genuinely engaged, not just a tick box exercise of public consultation. Um, that could be fun and more engaging, and I think, and that could be a really interesting use of 3D and technology. Okay, anyone else? No, not I've yet. terrified everyone. Everyone's but terrified of the neon now. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll take the opportunity, perhaps again, because I'm uh, quite uh, curious about, like, you, just now you expressed about making your imagination, and it could be, you know, treated uh, uh, twofold. Like one is realizing what, or, or making it real, what uh, what you have imagined, but the other part is uh, the actual exercise to imagine. Uh, 
I think it is super important uh, what we are aspiring to, what we are dreaming of, and the history of picturesque is actually about that. Of course, there's this, uh, it's closely uh, related with the marketing uh, moves uh, because it's basically the same process. You are selling the dream. What what would you get sometime in the future? But uh, at the same time, I think uh, the. This imagery you can consume is uh, utterly important uh, because these are the building blocks your imagination works with and assembles your possible available futures, which you would uh, at least mentally choose. Maybe I want a bit of this and a bit of that, and this is the life I want and this is I don't. So um, I'm thinking about uh, the video game uh, culture because at least uh, our generation has uh, grown with it with this imagery, and uh, we have seen uh, the SimCities, as you presented, which is uh, highly managerial, quite, you know, uh, <laughs> almost uh, uh, almost a, a spreadsheet uh, uh, culture there, which sort of teaches us how to, how to make a good, uh, maybe even equal, or even political city, but uh, basically it's, you know, number and economy based. And uh, on the other hand, we have uh, lots of games, uh, dystopias, uh, especially cyberpunk games, which uh, present as uh, future cities. Some of them are openly dystopian, some of them, like a lot of them, especially cyberpunk genre, are uh, this uh, hy <laughs> hypertrophied or hypergrown uh, capitalist cities, which uh, I'm sure the, cap, uh, the, the the market is booming there. You know, mm -hmm. the the economy is working, and uh, then we have uh, even more upcoming examples of uh, uh, which which is not yet games or, or stories, but the I don't know if you've heard about attempts to to build um, a, a solar punk genre, solar punk genre, uh, which uh, the, the people who are trying to imagine. A brighter future with uh, uh, ecological or, or green technology, uh, which would not be dystopian and, and consciously design or invent uh, a visual language or, or dream how it could work. And so far, as I'm seeing, they're not super successful and even drawing quite a lot of uh, this uh, sometimes uh, uh, greenwashing imagery from these architects or, or, or older times or. E I don't know, imperial uh, traits, uh, you know, much of a decoration which could uh, come only with uh, slave labor or inequality and, and so on. So there's a huge task uh, of, of imagining, but do you think this whole history we have gone through, uh, I think you, you could speak of, of um, this generation, we, which we have come f gone through in, in gaming uh, provided uh, imagery, did it affect us? Did it uh, do something to us culturally by infusing this imagination? I think, yeah, I don't know, about, don't know if it's just games, but certainly the imagery of kind of cyberpunk and technological futurism, which is now not just in games, but it's, you know, it's over every, I mentioned the Apple TV series, but it's over every Amazon and um, films and everything. I mean, it, it directly influenced Neon. So for instance, in the main offices of Neon, um, there's a huge wall chart, apparently, and it's got a list of every kind of cyberpunk future. So it's got cyberpunk all the way up to solarpunk, and I don't know, it's not my genre, but every kind of imaginary in between. Because Mohammed bin Salman had said, I want a cyberpunk city. So they started to map them and look at examples from games and films and everything, and they went, these are all really bad images. We can't be making a city around this image. So they had to map all the different cyberpunks out, and then they drawn a big circle around solarpunk. That's the one they're making, and that's the one they keep referring to. Solarpunk, and they've spoken about it a few times, about this direct mapping. Um, but basically because Mohammed bin Salman said, I want to build that city, and they went, no, because that's built on slave labor, it's not a great image. It might be what you're doing, but we can't tell everyone that, so let's make it look like Solarpunk. And it makes you realize that, even going back to the origin of the word utopia, Thomas More's utopia, which means non-place, a place of the imagination, um, it is the same as dystopia. Thomas More's utopia had the death penalty for quite small crimes. It had slave labor. You know, um, yes, it was a British imaginary, and our 
whole British thing is built upon, you know, these uh, horrible things like slave labor and our history. And so it was, but he was also critiquing it. And he was saying that, yes, it looks like utopia, but you cannot have utopia without dystopia. So the neon solar punk is also the cyberpunk and it is also built on slave labor. Um, so I don't know if it's just games, but certainly the, just the mass amount of images we have certainly I think feeds into stuff directly in that instance, but also, you know, with the kind of Zaha Hadidi, Patrick Schumacher, um, you know, um, parametric stuff going up, all comes out of wibbly wobbly sci-fi imaginaries. And just to think back to this, you, you were talking as well about this idea of infusion of data with SimCity. There was a really funny thing, which may, may, I think would be the, the most dystopian outcome for Neon and the canals of swimming children, would be um, when that last SimCity came out in 2013, they really put a lot of effort into making the data realistic. And ev they said every single person is like real and they will go home and they'll go to job and you can follow them and it's like, you know, like you're managing a real city. And what people found out very quickly when they turned the game on and started to map people is every time a school finished and like 200 school children left the school, they all filed out in a line and you could follow them. They just like filled up the houses away from the school as they went. They didn't go back to the home that they started at in the morning. They just went to the first house and then the next kid went to the next house. And then two kids went to the next house. And so every day they'd have different parents and this really weird dystopian thing. And I kind of think that's maybe what will just happen at Neon. We're all getting tracked and the algorithm will go wrong and the kids will just swim down different canals every day full of porridge and end up in different homes. But like, you know, they'll make lots of money, so it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so are we wrapping up already and uh, going towards your refreshments? Not, not yet, uh, but is it a question or is this a final word from you? It's just an idea. I, I thought about uh, that in your presentation you you've been mentioned uh, you have mentioned that uh, let's say the the english um, uh, let's say context of creating all those parks was inspired by other european uh, let's say uh, arts and uh, and cities mm -hmm. but uh, but i thought about the con contemporary all of these contemporary ideas uh, wherever they would be from from china from from middle east uh, don't you think that uh, they all been influenced by the english influence but but i mean not only from visual but from the literary one because the the main let, let's say uh, futuristic novels uh, science fiction fantasy all of that is coming from an English tradition, yeah. so. Or, or, yeah, American now, but English language. Um, I, think, I think this goes back to what Justin was just saying as well about imperialism. And, and I think it speaks to where we should look to think about future imaginaries. And for the last few hundred years, and I know I've shown a lot of them in this talk because it's the culture I'm from and my own teaching, and I come from a background of learning of that, we have to de-learn that. You know, this goes into this idea of decolonizing the curriculum and architecture, which doesn't just mean to be aware and, 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 and thinking about other histories, but we can also look to them, you know? Um, we don't just have to look back to these cliche ideas of stupid picturesque. And there is also lots of Chinese and Japanese histories of their kind of version of the picturesque, which isn't dissimilar and maybe hasn't come out the same way. And that does fold into the European idea of the picturesque and landscape painting and so on. So I've kind of given a narrow history of it, but we should maybe we should just stop looking at that canon and we should be aware of what the historical Saudi Arabian canon is. What they, how do they manage landscape? So for instance, Bangladesh, um, Marina Tabusam and um, another architect's dealing with flooding. You know, um, her houses, which cost $500 to make, um, for local people, can build it in their community or in their families themselves. Um, I recently spoke to her for some projects, and they wanted to build one of those houses in California for an art for Desert X, the art fair, or the um, biennial, sculptural biennial in the Coachella Valley. And they couldn't because it would have cost £50,000 to build in, in California because of the cost of materials, the labor rights, good things like labor rights, cost of materials, um, earthquake proofing, all kinds of things. So they couldn't build one. 
something which is genuinely a super, super cheap $500 solution because these are communities that live in the flood valleys and when the rivers change pattern and the floodwaters come in, you li they literally pick up the house, move it to another safe piece of land so when the rivers changed its shape. That would be super useful in California where there was snowing, huge amounts of snow last week and now it's going to go into a heat wave. R rivers flow and then they don't. You know, you need this sort of technology. We don't just need to look to English and European and re Renaissance and Baroque and modern American cultural ideas of how to think about the future and design the future. We can look elsewhere and I think increasingly we have to. So, you know, that includes from Vilnius and Central Europe and stuff, other cultures which have been flattened by kind of this monoculture, which, you know, I, I'm a part of and these things are talking to. So we should definitely look wider, I think. Thank you. I think uh, it's, our time is up.